Welcome everyone. I'd like to introduce you to the new funding model for New South Wales Health. Uh, what follows is a selection of uh, presentations which were given by uh, local New South Wales and national speakers at a recent New South Wales Health Symposium held in May 2012, where we had over 500 participants from across the health system who participated in a wide-ranging set of discussions about our new funding model. For the first time, uh, from 1 July, we will be funding district health services on the basis of activity-based funding and block grants for specific services. This is radically different from the traditional funding model of historical, historical block budgets. What this means is that for the first time, how we fund our health services will be far more transparent. And this will enable clinicians, our boards of, and management, our staff and our local communities to have much more understanding of how we fund our system, where the money is spent, and be able to participate in and contribute to decisions about the right resourcing of our system. It's going to be very important that everyone gains an understanding of this new model. It will mean that clinicians have more information in thinking about the types of patient care and models of care. It means that our, our boards will ha have more information for decision making and it means that our district model of health care will be far better supported to be able to organise and resource patient care around individual patient needs. It means for the first time we will be relating funding to clinical practice and individual patient care. Thank you very much indeed, Rowan. I too wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, pay my respect to elders past and present, and particularly any who are with us here today. Director General, distinguished guests, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see you here. There is one overriding consideration for every resident of New South Wales. They ask, can I get health treatment or health care when I need it? That's, a, that's the way I started a speech 10 years ago, and it hasn't really changed. This is an important consideration for everyone. It's for patients, their family and carers, uh, but it's also for clinicians and all involved in delivering health care. It's why I have placed such importance on devolution of responsibility for that treatment to be as close as possible to those who receive it and in the hands of those who will deliver it. I believe that the closer we have move decisions to local areas, the more we involve clinicians in decisions, the more we make our health system flexible and responsive, the better decisions we make, the better we serve the people of New South Wales. In health, we know that we, are con we constantly have to adapt our system to face a rapidly changing and ever more costly world of medicine, treatments and medical technologies. To keep pace we with progress in healthcare, we must also progress ourselves. We must continue to reform the way we work to meet changing needs and demands. Over the last year, as part of the O'Farrell government's focus on strengthening the health system to respond to what our community wants, uh, what wants and what we know creates good health outcomes, we've done several things. We have changed from a centralised department to a more strategic ministry. The next step is to reform how we fund the system and make the activities that are delivered to patients at the community level a key element and predictor of budget. This begins to happen from July the 1st. Reform, reform, reforming funding is the next element in delivering health care that is more centred around patients and a health system that is more open to outside scrutiny. As a state, we want to continue to lead change rather than follow. We want to drive strongly towards a more effective health and hospital system, not wait for others. We're working collaboratively with the Commonwealth. Uh, there's still much work to be done done, but for New South Wales, we must continue to take the lead. 
For New South Wales, making funding reform work is a key part of how we lead our own system towards better health outcomes. Funding reform lets us shape a hospital system that needs constant refreshing and new directions. The one certainty about health is that new science and medicine emerges every day and that we need to keep changing fast just to maintain our edge. And as the Minister for Medical Research, going around the institutes, talking to the researchers, talking to the clinicians that are engaged in that transitional research, it's just mind-blowing, it's inspiring. But we need to make room in our budget to adopt these new treatments. For the people of New South Wales, knowing that their health system and their hospitals are constantly responding to change is reassuring. It means they know they have a system that is moving forward, improving, adapting, continually striving to meet their needs. Funding reform is the next step in our quest for a better health system. It will not be the fast change we make, the last change we make. Rather, it is another practical move forward that will make our hospitals as effective as they can be. As long as we keep setting the pace of positive change directed to opening and freeing up the New South Wales system, health system, we can all be confident that patients and consumers will remain at the heart of our efforts and at the centre of why we make decisions. That's the key to the change that starts on July 1. All of us here are part of that change and I trust that you will all join me in embracing the opportunities that arise from the funding reforms so that we will be able to answer yes when that consumer asks us the question, will there be the right treatment, the right health care at the right hospital available to me when I need it? Thank you. I look forward to joining you in this new reform. Thank you. Some of you will be aware that I've been working in the Commonwealth for the last six years. In that period, both in Canberra and since I've been back, one of the most striking features is just how far ahead the level of knowledge and understanding of activity-based funding and health reform is within the New South Wales Senior Executive Service. And that's largely in fact, primarily been due to the level of expertise brought to this conversation by our Director General. It's undeniably true that uh, Mary Foley has a greater understanding of activity-based funding than any Director General in the country. Um, Mary is now going to present to us the state funding model. Critically, uh, activity-based funder is a major reform driver for better patient care. Globally, prospective case payment, which is a more generic term for what in this country we're calling activity-based funding, it's had lots of different names, um, is used to fund hospitals in, in over 20 countries or 70% of the uh, OECD. And, the most, and, and often it gets talked about that it's all about efficiency, and it's not really. Um, uh, yes, uh, whether we're doing things efficiently in terms of cost, um, is, is an element that, that, that this drives when you compare the performance of, of different uh, hospitals or, or services. But the most critical thing about it and why it's very, very, very key to, to what we need to achieve in, in, in our devolved uh, uh, model is, uh, is that it gives the transparency which, which enables local planning and decision making as well as the transparency that allows uh, from a whole of state point of view to to actually work out where we're going with our health system, uh, are we getting it right, what are the gaps, um, uh, what are the access issues, have we got the right models of care. We've got two levels of reform happening here. Um, the Minister has talked about the, the, the State Government's commitment to a devolved uh, model of care, of, of local decision making with strong clinician and community engagement. This is a theme of health reform globally. 
if we're going to organise care properly around the patient, uh, the models of care need to be localised around the patient. They need to be flexible and they need to be able to join the dots and connect up care across a range of providers and a range of settings. Uh, transparency is absolutely key to being able to support that local decision making. Uh, and, and as well, in terms of our state government um, model, we have to work within state budget parameters. The federal government, in, in the process of the, of the arrangements, is, it's their job to put in place the, the various national structures uh, that are going to be part of this arrangement. They uh, are also now going to put their, their Medicare grant, as I still uh, call it, that's what it used to be called, um, and then it became the ACCAs, the Australian Healthcare Funding Agreements. Um, but they're putting that amount that they always um, pay to the states in respect of offering free public hospital treatment, a contribution to state systems, which was negotiated every five years between premiers and uh, uh, prime ministers and treasurers. So they're going to put that money into a national funding pool for it to be paid now and activity-based funding basis for the most part and uh, most importantly in two years time which is a, quite a long way away yet uh, they will also be committed to helping to support the growth pressures in our system but let's focus on the next two years because the next two years are critical transitional years the other important um, th considerations in this next two years is the, the Commonwealth funding which came in that lump sum um, uh, to the states interstate Treasury mixed with the state money, with state health authorities, and then allocated out to our health services. That special purpose payment uh, will, now, um, will now be paid uh, through a national pool, largely in the form of activity-based funding. But it's important to emphasise that there is, there is no additional growth uh, in those Commonwealth contributions for the next two years. That's a capped amount of money. We know what it's going to be. It, 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 it's um, in the Commonwealth budget for next year and the forward estimates for the for the year after that. Uh, the Commonwealth price that they'll be paying uh, or share of the price they'll be paying will be determined by dividing the special purpose payment by the volumes of service in our state. So in this state, the special purpose payment funds about 34% of the cost of our local health district and network services. So, so the, the Commonwealth share of the, of the unit cost of delivering a patient episode in our service will, will, will come out at about 34%. So that's the underlying contribution the Commonwealth makes to uh, our health system, and that will now, most of it, morph into uh, an activity-based funding model. And that's the component that will be paid for the next two years through the national pool. The other challenges that we have to consider in these next two years is we also have a number of national partnership agreements that have been developed over the last few years years with the Commonwealth and that has led to significant funding uh, initiatives which we've benefited from and, and for the next two years the volume pressures on the system will, will need to be met by state governments from, from their resources. So, so it's quite a, we're looking at quite a tight budgetary environment for the next two years. To try and uh, sort of say well what does all this mean, th this is really trying to break up for all our local health districts and specialty networks is, is um, where the money comes from. You can see uh, in, in blue, the, uh, for the next two years, the Commonwealth components um, and, and the con if we, this, I've taken this year's budget and broken it up into these boxes, which are the sorts of boxes we'll be funding from in the future. In terms of grappling with this whole concept about price, it's really important to understand that the pricing of services will operate at three levels. There's the national efficient price, which is what IPA is all about. It's, IPA is independent and uh, sets the national price. Uh, essentially, the national price determines the Commonwealth contribution because under the agreement from 1415, the Commonwealth is on the hook to pay um, a, 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 a given share of that national efficient price wherever that lands. And that price will be a blend of the pricing all around the country. Then there's also, and more probably more importantly from in terms of what the district receives, there is, is the state price and the state funding model, because it's the overall state pricing that will deter and funding model that will determine what each local health district receives, and then the national efficient price contribution from the Commonwealth will be a subset of that. And then thirdly, there'll be 
uh, local health district or network pricing because each each health service will have to organise how to allocate its funds. It will need to allocate out of those funds, funds to overheads. It will then need to work out how it will fund each of its constituent um, hospitals and, and, and other services. Our key priority during the next two transition years is to keep the system safe and operating while we're introducing some critical new funding drivers. So we'll ha have a cautious and evolving approach to, to, to the model. Um, that we will be using transition grants to um, support those local health districts whose, whose cost of operation um, uh, is currently above where it would otherwise be if you, if you priced it according to, to the, the new transparent funding model. And initially, those local health districts that operate at or below the efficient price will be funded at their current efficient rate. So, uh, and our state pricing structure, we'll, we'll adopt the IPA design. You, we don't want to have one national design and then a different state design. This is complex enough without creating confusion. At the moment, in IPA's draft determination, they're proposing loadings for specialist paediatric uh, hospital services, indigenous patients, and services provided to patients from outer regional or remote locations. So we'll in incorporate those uh, in our design. Uh, previously, when we've had shadow state models, we've had peer hospitals and some other adjustments. We're not going to do that. We will align with the, the national model. So that's it. And, uh, um, and I'm sorry if I've crowded the next speaker's time. We'll work something out. Thank you. So what activity-based funding will do is to give us much better information that will support both clinicians and managers to identify the resources, to apply those effectively, to, del to deliver the best outcomes for patients in whatever setting of care. So by having information about the cost of providing care, uh, our clinicians can work with managers to adjust how they provide that, to use resources more efficiently, and ultimately to invest in the right places to ensure that our services meet the needs of our patients. So we need to do a lot more about collecting information. I think we have reasonable information around what it, provi what it costs to provide care in an acute inpatient setting uh, and in an emergency department. But uh, as we move into providing outpatients, subacute and mental health, we all recognise the need to increase and improve our collection of activity and the costs attributed to providing care in those settings. We recognise that what we do at the moment, we're doing very well by world-class standards. Um, but what this information will enable us to do is to start to think about how we can provide care in different ways and move the system from being focused on inpatients and inpatient care to care in the community, outpatients, in subacute services and mental health. And I think those shifts and that direction is one that we all recognise is important if we're going to manage the demands on the system in the future. So if we only have a finite amount of money to spend on health, we need a system to make each health dollar go further. So if we were to de design an ideal system, we'd want it to be patient-centred, we'd want it to cost less, we'd do that through driving efficiency, but we'd also want it to be focused on best clinical practice. And potentially, the exciting thing about activity-based funding is if this is implemented correctly, it has the potential to meet all these needs. So the next question I often get asked is, doesn't cheaper care mean worse outcomes for patients? And you'll probably be aware of the evidence that's been coming out of uh, the United States with the Intermountain Group that's been published over the last couple of years that really shows that you can improve quality outcomes and they can actually cost less. So if we think of activity-based funding and where the clinicians fit in, to simplify this, how does this actually work? So we provide a service to the patient. We document this in the medical record. And as you know, this is usually done by the most junior members of the clinical staff. The medical records are then coded. That information is classified into a diagnosis-related group. And through a complex series of systems that I don't begin to understand, that information is sent back to the government. And the local health district is then funded for that activity with a few other variables, including efficiency, costed in.
Importantly, that data though is then used to generate performance reports and that's fed back to clinicians. And that data, if correct, can be used to drive efficiency and then help with resource allocation. So understanding that process, where do the clinicians then fit in? Clinicians are obviously service providers. They're also the documenters, and because it's the junior staff doing this, they, senior staff also need to be the supervisors of this process. Now there's more communication required with coding staff, and so communication channels needed to be opened up there. The data that comes back, the clinicians need to interpret it and importantly understand it, and then use that data potentially to affect change. And then more now than ever have more input into funding allocation. So clinicians have a huge role in every step of this process along the way. And so engaging them is going to be critical to the success of implementing activity-based funding. So what are the education messages that we've been trying to do to counter some of the misconceptions along the way? The first thing is that essentially we have a wonderful health system and we're all working towards the same goal and the patient is at the centre of that goal. Clinicians focus very much on best clinical practice and evidence-based medicine and ABF is not mutually exclusive to that. So if you ask a clinician what's best clinical practice, they'll tell you they want something that's patient-centered or patient-focused, evidence-based, equitable and easily accessible, efficient and benchmarked against our peers, and is evolving because there's rapid developments in medicine all the time, so these sort of things need to be regularly updated. And when you look at what activity-based funding can potentially deliver, they can meet all of those needs. So individual pa patient data over time will be able to be collected. This um, will lead to evidence being generated because we'll have enough data at the patient level that we won't have had previously. It'll be much more equitable because of the transparency of funding and we'll know where that funding is going. Because of efficiency, there'll be reduced waiting lists and so accessibility will be easier. That patient, individual patient data will allow cost variation uh, and investigation of that to further benchmarking against our peers. And regular review of this system will allow us to learn and improve from those inefficiencies. The second message that I try and get out to clinicians is that ABF does not limit the amount hospitals can spend on individual patients. Clinicians worry very much about individual patients and how they will be allowed to treat them in the future. The third message links on from that and is that clinicians determine the care needed for the patients and that ABF funds hospitals based on averages and we know some patients cost more but some patients will also cost less. Fourthly, ABF is not a cost-cutting exercise and it actually does promote evidence-based practice and that's the one that I often listen to the most. So the funds that have been set aside for each of the treatment categories actually re reflect the evidence-based treatment options, not the cheapest treatment options. So if there's two options for treatment and both have similar outcomes and one's cheaper, then obviously this system would identify that and allow us to use that cheaper option. The last message is in terms of the time side of things is that it doesn't necessarily mean more paperwork and more documentation. It's just it's the quality of documentation that needs to change. And we all know the importance of recording the full complexity of our patient stays because that's going to maximise the funding for our individual hospitals. Well, I imagine that the benefits for clinicians are that it could drive some improvements in the way that they practice because they'll have better data um, that enables them to compare their practice uh, nationally, um, but also that if there's incentives uh, to drive quality practice, then I imagine it will be much more rewarding for clinicians to practice in a system that is giving them rewards to deal with more complex cases rather than focusing on throughput and efficiency because ultimately most clinicians want to see consumers get the best possible healthcare outcomes and really that's the potential we want to see achieved here. 
Well, look, this new approach could potentially really drive um, at quality outcomes for health consumers um, if it really takes into account their needs and it takes into account uh, quality as the driver for improvements in the health system. Um, and what we need to make sure is that we don't uh, let slip the groups that actually really need access to services, um, particularly rural and regional groups, um, some of the high needs consumers we need to make sure that what we're doing is targeting the more complex cases. So for instance, it might be easier uh, to treat a 35-year-old with an appendectomy in a city hospital versus a 35-year-old schizophrenia patient uh, in a regional hospital. Um, but we don't want perverse incentives that mean that uh, the 35-year-old with schizophrenia misses out on services. It's critical um, that we're meeting the needs of um, a whole range of consumers, particularly those who don't always get um, the best care or access to care in the Australian health system now. Well, I suppose in the Australian health system at the moment, um, we really are focused on throughput and efficiency. Um, I think one of the really key challenges for the, uh, the ABF is to ensure that um, we're driving quality outcomes in healthcare. And I'd imagine that for clinicians, um, that's a very rewarding situation to be in if the quality of care is incentivised and if they're able to um, see uh, greater benefits from treating more complex cases in the health system. And also, I think some penalties or sanctions for poor practice, such as when people um, are given the wrong medication, for instance, or when they acquire a hospital infection. I think these are the sorts of things that uh, the ABF has the potential to improve quality of health care. And ultimately, for clinicians and for consumers who use the system, um, this is uh, the real outcome that this um, new health reform can deliver. In the near future, you will see uh, an activity-based funding system from IPA that will define a national efficient price and classification for these services. We also will define adjustments to the efficient price. So we will define um, in our coming policy statement, we'll define what we've identified so far as three adjustments. One is for Indigenous patients, and we're in debate with the jurisdictions right now as to quantum. But there is statistically a very definite difference between um, the Indigenous status of patients and their costs. Unfortunately for New South Wales, uh, there's not a lot of gain in the next uh, loading, which is remote residents. In fact, it's outer regional remote and very remote um, residents, according to the uh, Australian government, uh, Australian Geo geographic classification system. Um, uh, we've found that people who live in outer regional remote or very remote Australia do have a definite cost uh, differential to those who live elsewhere in Australia. We've also found across the country, interestingly, every jurisdiction that is implementing an ABF program has struggled with their um, specialist paediatric hospitals and what to do about them. Um, it's interesting across the nation, there is a definite difference in some DRGs between specialist paediatric hospitals and um, general hospitals that provide paediatric care. Statistically different uh, cost differential which we'll recognise in terms of a loading, but it'll only be for some DRGs, and we'll publish which DRGs, obviously. We'll be publishing our specifications um, in our determination. They'll largely be a reference to existing specifications, so there won't be anything revelatory in that announcement. We'll also be publishing our block funding criteria. We also have the terrible burdensome duty. I spent all last night wrestling with a document which I've been wrestling with for six months on defining what is a public hospital service. 
So we will publish in the near future a description of what is a public hospital service in Australia. It won't be campus based, so services that reach out into the community will be included and it won't be um, uh, restricted to provider. There are some services in this state and others that are provided by private organisations on behalf of public hospitals. So it'll be service based and it'll be uh, related to um, uh, a set of principles which we'll publish. The reason that's important is that services that are defined as public hospital services qualify for Commonwealth funding and services that don't, um, don't qualify for Commonwealth funding under this agreement. There are other agreements, but not this agreement. And we'll also publish our dispute determinations and assessments when we get them. Thank you for taking the time to view this important information. I hope you've found it of assistance. I'd like to thank all of you for the excellent work you do in caring for our community. I'd also like to thank all of those who participated and presented in the New South Wales Health Symposium on the funding model. The discussion uh, has greatly assisted us in communicating about uh, these important changes and in enabling us to share this with you. I'd like to also suggest that you go to the New South Wales Health website if you need more information. We have a range of material and resources there that will be of further assistance. And I look forward over the next 12 months to working with you all in implementing our new funding model.